Welcome to today's webinar, uh, Seeing the Whole Blueprint, Uncovering the Purpose of Genomic Junk. Uh, I'm Ankur Jain. Uh, I'm a Whitehead Institute member and an assistant professor of biology at MIT, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's event. Today's webinar is the second in the series of talks that we have organized uh, at the Whitehead Institute to share our science with the broader community. Our topic today is Seeing the Whole Blueprint, Uncovering the Purpose of Genomic Junk. And in a few moments, we'll hear from our presenter, Whitehead Institute member, Yukiko Yamashita. She'll highlight the ways in which fundamental research that is being done at Whitehead brings novel biological processes to light. And she'll introduce uh, us to her lab's latest research on the function of satellite DNA, uh, which had long been regarded as genomic junk. Uh, before we get started, uh, a couple of logistical reminders. Um, this webinar is being recorded for future viewing. Uh, well, Yukiko will also be fielding questions uh, towards the end of her talk, and you can submit um, your questions at any point by using the Q&A box. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to introduce Yukiko Yamashita. Uh, Yukiko is the Susan Linquist Chair for Women in Science at Whitehead. She is a professor of biology at MIT and an investigator with the Harvard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, the Yamashita lab studies the process of germ cell development, a process that is critical to the continuation of species. Uh, Yukiko earned both her bachelor's um, in biology and her PhD in biophysics from Kyoto University in Japan. She conducted her postdoctoral research at Stanford University. And prior to joining us at Whitehead, uh, she was a faculty member at the University of Michigan. Uh, Yukiko has earned uh, numerous very prestigious awards, including being named um, a MacArthur Fellow, a Searle Scholar, and she, uh, as well as grants from Keck Foundation, Nyoga University, and the American Society for Cell Biology. Uh, with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Yukiko. Um, we are looking forward to learning about your work. Thank you very much. I have to share the screen first and then this way and then get it so uh is this okay um yeah thank you very much anka for the introduction and i'm really you know the hi everyone and i'm really excited to present you know the what my lab is doing right now and kind of um yeah and then well so i want to give you some sort of you know the southern who build more more than the detail of the data or that kind of things and especially like how to say and my hope today is to convey this you know excitement of exploring into really uncharted territory and hopefully you can see that you know that you can't really prescribe what you might discover you have to just go with it and then that but that gives you so much you know the joy um, along the way so uh, today, you know, I want to really tell you about your know, function of junk. What is it, right? So I think, you know, the uh, one, you know, why I decided to study this is I often, you know, one sort of misperception I encounter often is this, you know, with the genome sequences, we have human genome sequence. Many people feel the world is like this. We have blueprint of everything, every single tool, and we know how it works, etc. So that means with the CRISPR technology, for example, these days, if you find any mutations in any patient, now you can fix it right away because we know exactly how it works. But I, I you know, I'd like to say that's actually the big misperception. Because you know, if you look at all those, you know, the blueprint of our, you know, the genome, often case we find something like this, you know, the something that looks like a tool, but you don't know what it is at all, right? And then if you find, if you know, that you find a mutation or some sort of variation in that kind of tools of unknown function, uh, it, it you know, that we have a, you know, the we as a you know as a whole community as a society or you know the medical field uh, we will have a harder time to really see if that is really causing sudden you know the uh you know the symptom of the disease or it's just a harmless variation so you you start with this whatever the tool of unknown function let's say you find a variation in a patient something like this is it bad or it's okay 
uh, or something like this, you know, those things are, you know, in half, is it bad or, uh, you know, it's okay. Or it comes in a different color. Is it good or bad? It's really difficult to judge, which is really in contrast to the situation where we know the function of the tool perfectly well, such as screwdriver. So in this, you know, in case of a screwdriver, we know exactly how it works. That means if you see a mutation, something like this, you know, the, the tip of the screwdriver is chopped off, we know it's not gonna work. So that means we have to fix it and then we probably know how to fix it. Um, but, you know, the, because we also know the, how screwdriver works, it comes in a variation in the color of the handle or a little bit of slight difference in the shape of the handle, we know this works. So this variation is not going to affect anything. So now let's go back to this mysterious tool. How can we judge any variation is bad or good? So for that, you need to understand the mechanism of action, how this is really functioning. And then to just give you the, you know, the answer for this particular tool, uh, this is how it works. Actually, you can actually pop it up. And this is actually the portable, uh, you know, coffee dripper. Uh, when you want to bring your coffee to, you know, the outdoor activities like camping. So now, finally, when you understand the mechanism of that tool, how that tool works, now you can tell the, you know, the color variation, this blue one, is totally okay. You know, it's not gonna, you know, the interfere any of the functions of coffee dripper. If it's in half, probably it's not gonna work. You have to find a way to fix it if you wanna have coffee. If you have a big hole in the middle, but what, now that you know what it is, probably if you can put the, you know, coffee filter or maybe two of that, and then if you know to, you know, the slowly pour the hot water, probably this is workable, right? So this is one thing. Uh, and then, uh, you know, in studying uh, the all sorts of, you know, the going into the, uh, the mechanism of, you know, the how life works, we use Drosophila in my lab. And then, you know, if you look at this fruit fly often case, you know, I also get the lots of questions of why do you study this tiny insect, you know, that is that really useful at all? Uh, you know, the Drosophila was established as a model system by, you know, this famous Thomas Hunt Morgan. Without his, him and his uh, colleagues' contribution to the field, we would know that all of those genes, which is an element of the inheritance, are on the chromosomes. Also, uh, many genes involved in cancer were first identified in the Drosophila. So, you know, the, the, the you know, the demonstrating the, you know, the importance of the model system. So my view of using Drosophila is something like this, you know, to, uh, you know, to understand, you know, how, you know, the Lego house is built, you can start with a little bit of, you know, that you want to start with a little bit of simplified version of it to something like this, before you can go into way much more complicated Lego castle. Really important aspect of it is, uh, you know, both of these, you know, the tiny Lego house or ginormous Lego castle are both made of the same unit, such as cell. So by understanding smaller version, now I think, you know, you can actually get the much, you know, the better picture of how more complicated things might function. Okay, so I just told you that our genome is full of tools of unknown functions right? That sounds bad enough. But if you look at the actual whole genome of our human chromosomes, things are even worse. Because these all those tools of known function and unknown function only goes to 20% of our genome. So the remaining 80% are mostly considered as junk. What does that mean, right? Uh, okay. So, uh, so let me let me explain what is junk. So this is the you know the micrograph version as well as cartoon version of the chromosome on which our genes are on. You know these are made of you know the DNA and the protein complex, and then that contains all of the the blueprint of our life. So and then all of those the the genes typically that you know the code for the blueprint for or you know the recipe for the protein or tools, right? Uh, typically on this blue, you know, the light blue area. 
but you see ton of ton of you know the area that doesn't have any you know the so-called coding capacity so these so that these area uh, often occupied by so-called satellite dna um, which is a tandem repetitive dna for example aatat sequence is repeated a million times for megabases of the dna sequences and these, you know, the satellite DNA is really ubiquitous and abundant, it can be more than 50% of the genome, depending on the species. Despite this abundance of ubiquity, uh, this has been typically regarded as junk because it's non-coding, meaning it doesn't produce any proteins. So it re if you look at the, you know, the language of the DNA, it really looks like a gibberish. So that's why this, you know, the satellite DNA has been regarded as, or disregarded as junk. Um, so the several years ago, you know, the, I and my former postdoc, Madhav Jaganastan, you know, when he started, we sat down and then said, it doesn't make any sense. 80% of our genome is completely junk or useless. That's how we decided to study this. And that was the only, you know, can't be completely useless. That was the only motivation for us to start this. Um, so then since then, what we discovered is this. So in the, you know, the, this is a typically, you know, that any, you know, cells contains the multiple chromosomes, right? But then, you know, the, this chromosome as a shape only appears in, a, you know, the only certain phase of the, you know, the, you know, when cells are only getting ready for the cell division. But uh, in, the, in the real life, these chromosomes are more, you know, the, doesn't have a shape and then just packaged in the nucleus. And when that's happening, people have known this satellite DNA kind of associated with each other from the multiple chromosomes. And this aggregation or clustering has been cytologically defined as a chromocenter. This presence of chromocenter as a structure, cytological structure has been noted like almost, you know, the hundred years. Um, but you know, its function has not been known. So what we found is, uh, okay, uh, sorry. And this is actually the real version of the chromosome you can see uh, over here. And you know, the, this blue shows all of those chromosomes, you know, the, when cells are getting ready for the cell division. And it is magenta or red decorating the chromosomes. These are the specific satellite DNA sequence, in this case, AAT, AAT repeats. And if you look at the, on the individual chromosome, you see many spots, right? But in a real cell, you see the same, this, you know, the red sequence comes into one spot like this, you know, the over here. So this, uh, you know, that represent this, you know, the clustering of the chromosomes. And we discovered uh, how this is, you know, that this chromosome is formed. We found a protein called the D1, I mean, um, um, so, and then this protein has the ability to bind to this AATAT sequence and then bring multiple AATAT bearing DNA together to, you know, the, to bundle many chromosomes, just like a Velcro. So, and then, you know, the, as you can see here, DNA strand is over here and over here, and then D1 can just bridge them together. So that means in the absence of D1 protein, you cannot bridge the chromosomes together. And then this is what you see. Uh, over here. Now, instead of having one major, you know, the clustering over here of the AATAT, D1 mutant, which cannot cluster this DNA, uh, AATAT DNA, have multiple AATAT spots like this. Okay, so then the next obvious question is what to do chromocenters uh, have to, why chromosome has to be bundled, or what's the function of the chromocenter, right? And then if you mutate this D1 proteins to disrupt the chromosome formation or chromosome bundling, uh, you lose the cells a lot. So this is a control situation. It is a Drosophila testis, contains lots of germ cells, which is a precursor for making sperm. And you know, the control or viral type situation, you have many, many cells showing green over here, but the mutants quickly lose the cells. So that means at least that told us this protein or chromos chromosome bundling is important, right? Because cells are dying. But why cells are, how cells are dying? Without knowing it, the only conclusion we can make is, yeah, this is an important period. Um, 
So, but we, we are kind of, you know, stuck over here. Like this is important, but how this is important, why this is important, we didn't know. And, you know, the, we, we had, you know, that this is, a, you know, the research, you know, unprescribed research. We are really stuck about it here and we don't understand why this is happening, how this is happening. And then, you know, Madhav and I was, you know, the staring at the, you know, this image for, for a while actually during our meeting, I believe. And then we were just staring at it. And then one moment we realized, ah, what is this? I don't know if you notice, here's a black spot, which is not green, right? So, and then we started to wonder, what is this? Why there is a, some sort of, you know, the dark holes over here, what does this mean? And then when we saw this, now we, we thought we might have an answer, which turned out to be the case. So it turned out to be, it's a small nucleus, uh, you know, in control situation, you know, the each cell have just one nice round nucleus, which is shown in the green over here. All DNAs, all of your chromosomes are, you know, the encapsulated one nucleus by one envelope like this, you know, in a circle nucleus. If you don't bundle the chromosome, what you see is you know, the some chromosomes start coming out of this nucleus to form its own tiny nucleus like this. And it turned out this was a reason why cells are dying, right? Based on these data and the some as a, you know, a little bit of detailed data that I'm not going to show. Uh, so we came to this, you know, idea. Okay, so the chromosomes are typically bundled by chromocenter like this, and then as I told you, this so for to bundle all those chromosomes, you need this, you know, the protein that can, you know, the bring all the DNA together by binding to saturated DNA, which is uh, the D1. And this bundling of all those chromosomes is likely the reason how cells can encapsulate everyone in one nuclear envelope. In the absence of this bundling, now individual chromosomes are free from each other. They are not anchored to each other. So now individual chromosomes start floating out of the nucleus to form its own micronuclei um, or nucleus. Uh, to, so then this actually lead to the cell death. Um, okay, so that based on that, you know, we want to really propose junk or saturated DNA is actually not really junk. It's a crit critical constituent of the chromosomes to form a single nucleus. So let me just recap as conceptually. So we human beings have 46 chromosomes, right? And that all, you know, that together, uh, uh, you know, the encode the whole blueprint of our life. So that means all the books or all those blueprint has to be in one place, which is that nucleus. Everything, all those information has to be in one place. This is very much like the situation where you have to put the all the volumes of encyclopedia in one place to have a full information. Uh, so then in case of the chromosomes, this, you know, the putting all information in one place is done by physical linking of the chromosome, all of those books together, just like a bookshelf, uh, you know, then a nuclear envelope, you know, does encapsulate all of those chromosomes. And this bundling or, you know, the gluing is done by a protein uh, called D1, just as, as I told you. Okay, so that means, right, the people thought, oh, saturated DNA does not have its, con you know, the content information. You know, if you go through the page of encyclopedia, you know, the, the satellite DNA, it does not participate to that part. Instead, you know, it's not, it doesn't have a content information, but it's critical to contain the information, very much like a book spine or, uh, you, know, you know, so that you know which books to put together into one place. So now uh, in the last few minutes, I wanna spend just a little bit of a time, you know, how we are going with this information. And then again, uh, you know, I wanna kind of illustrate how, you know, um, you know, the prescribed research might go. So when, finally, when we convinced ourselves that the satellite DNA is not junk, we had to face one interesting, you know, well-known fact, which is, um, you know, the saturated DNA is actually highly divergent between even very closely related species. So that is true between, for example, human beings and the chimpanzee or gorilla. 
uh, you know, the coding sequence or, you know, the non-junk part of the DNA is very much similar, but a satellite DNA is very much different between those two species. Same things, uh, to, you know, the uh, true with Drosophila melanogaster, that's our laboratory, you know, the model uh, organisms and its sibling species called the Drosophila simulans. And you know, the, all those different satellite DNA is shown in a different color over here on the chromosome. And then you can just, you don't have to know what it is, but just the color difference tells you melanogaster and the simulans um, don't have any, uh, you know, the, I mean, not, don't have much similarity. But, you know, as an insect, they look very much the same. And if you, somebody bring one fly to me, is this melanogaster of similar? I won't be able to tell. Uh, you know, the melanogaster and the similar are very much alike. And then they, uh, you know, the most of the genes are very much the same. So, but now, okay, let's think about this. Those two species have very different satellite DNA, like, uh, you know, depicted in, uh, you know, the blue or greenish, you know, satellite DNA versus orange satellite DNA. If you make a species hybrid, meaning you make the Drosophila melanogaster with similar, so they are that close, they can mate, they are that close, but then they bring in two kind of, you know, chromosomes together, right? This is very much the situation when you have one set of encyclopedia, and you have a completely different second set of encyclopedia. Their contents, if you probably go through, you know, the each entry, each contents of these two encyclopedia, I'm sure you can find the very similar information. Content is very much the same, you know, the, no matter which country you leave, you know, the, our knowledge and, you know, all of those, you know, things are pretty much the same. But they are those, you know, the information is bundled slightly differently. So that means they are not, exactly the same so so it, is this a problem or not that so that it became our idea so okay so you can cross as i said uh melanogaster with simulans if you do so the hybrid the you know the progeny of the discrossing would be you know the hybrid female you know the daughters are sterile and then sons are dead and then if you look at this female sterile female they barely have any germ cells, that's an egg precursor cells in their ovary. So uh, this is how it actually looks like. And over here, I'm showing a melanogaster, just a pure species ovary. And then these blue cells over here, like there's a probably tens, you know, 30, 40s of those, those cells over here. This is a precursor to generate the eggs of this melanogaster, right? Uh, on the contrary, if you make a hybrid, they still make an ovary fairly okay, but these blue cells, you know, that these egg cell precursors are very much reduced. And then eventually by the time this, you know, the, this, you know, the ovary fully develops, so all of those germ cells are pretty much gone. Okay. Um, and then, but we wanted to take a look even a little more, you know, the closer look. So, okay, so the, here's the idea, right? If you look at the pure species, all nucleus contains all the chromosomes with the compatible satellite DNA like this. So that means these chromosomes can be bundled completely okay. That helps to contain all information, all the volumes of encyclopedia into single nucleus. That's how you see very nice, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the nuclear envelope that's encapsulating all the DNA in it. Here is a situation, it's a pure species, but you, you have, uh, you know, the protein, you know, the, this, you know, the bundling protein mutated. In that case, you cannot bundle the chromosomes. Then you end up with having micronuclei because, you know, now, you know, the, all those books are scattered. So that's how you see the micronucleus over here, right? Now, in a situation of a hybrid, now you have a two set of the books that is not quite compatible, which we thought. So maybe these, you know, the, uh, the chromosomes with the same satellite DNA might be bundled. We don't know, but you know, we guessed. And then, you know, there's orange satellite DNA containing chromosome maybe bundled, okay. But can they bundle it together or not? That became a question. And indeed, as we suspected, uh, in the hybrid situations, those, you know, the, uh, the germ cells, egg precursor cells have 
ton of micronuclei like this, you know, that there's a big nucleus and there's some another nucleus over here and then smaller nucleus like this, um, meaning, or, you know, the, to, to us, this suggests that, you know, that they fail to bundle chromosomes as this cartoon indicates. Okay, so now I, I think, you know, that we are coming up to this idea. This might be a reason why hybrid cells are not happy. And then, you know, the chromosome from two species are not quite compatible with each other. And then we wonder, this might be the, how, you know, the species split into two. Um, just to summarize, uh, you know, the today, you know, the, I told you about the satellite DNA, which has been regarded as junk, but our conclusion is it's not junk. It doesn't have, it doesn't contain content information, but it has a critical function to contain the contents, right, to bundle the chromosomes, right, connecting all those chromosomes for the encapsulation, you know, to put the, all those volumes of the books into one place uh, together. So that's the function we think. Uh, and then, you know, the second part, now we are guessing this, you know, the divergence in the book spine or those kind of meta information, not the contents, might be the cause of the hybrid incompatibility or how two species get split from each other. Uh, with that, uh, and then, you know, the actually knowing satellite DNA is not junk has opened up so much, so many lines of the inquiries uh, in my lab. And then we, um, so we are really excited uh, in addressing those, you know, the really new questions that, you know, came out of this, you know, the finding. So with that, I want to thank all my love. And then, you know, the, we, I just joined in the middle of the pandemic. So that means we actually never get to uh, have a chance to have a group picture yet. So this is a, you know, patchwork of the old love and the new love and so on. But, uh, you know, I can't wait to, you know, for the day that everybody get together and to take a new picture. And I want to thank all of those, you know, the, uh, for the support, for funding, and then community, and so on. And thank you so much, and happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thanks, Sukiko, for that wonderful talk. It's amazing. We have several questions pouring in. Uh, I'll start with the first one. Um, uh, one attendee is asking about what technologies do we do you use to visualize these repeats and in general to conduct uh, this research in repetitive elements and what are yeah. the uh, what are the key limitations uh, of these technologies? Right. Um, yes, so just to visualize those specific DNA on the chromosome, it's relatively easy. That's so called the DNA uh, in situ hybridization. So if you have, you know, the one strand of the DNA, you can design the complementary DNA that's going to hybridize with each other. I mean, you know, they, you know, adhere to each other, um, you know, as a, they form the DNA double strand. Um, so in doing so, you can design a probe that is, uh, you know, the, the bound with a fluorophore so that, you know, the AATAT can be visualized in red and then some other different sequence can be visualized in green. So that is, yeah, uh, you know, the visualization is not that bad. Uh, the really challenging part is this repetitiveness of a sequence. That means it's really difficult to completely read those sequencing and then uh, the align on the chromosomes. So when we typically say, you know, whole genome sequencing, we typically just ignore the repetitive region. So that means even, you know, even today, the entire sequence of the repetitive region, including satellite DNA, is not really completed for most of the species. Uh, you know, for some, you know, the beetle species, you know, we started having some, you know, the pretty good assembly of exactly how the repeat region might look like, but it's not complete. And then far from knowing of all different species yet. So that means, you know, it's it's really difficult to, if you don't know what's in there, you know, if you can't sequence, um, it's really difficult to go after, right? So yeah, and then we often joke, um, you know, uh, that means, you know, that there's no competitor. <laughs> Nobody, because they don't have information. The problem is we don't have information either. So yeah, it's a, it's a still a challenge, but I think, you know, 
so one my one hope is you know the, by doing you know the, our kind of research too i we can hopefully get enough number of the people get excited about this and then more effort is put into uh sequencing and then really mapping these you know the satellite of dna um of the you know the you know of the many species genome yeah another question is um what portion uh, so junk DNA is about half of the genome, as you mentioned, what fraction of it is responsible for chromosomal bundling? And are there any other functions that you hypothesize or, uh, or that your lab is looking into? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a really interesting question. Uh, we don't know how much is necessary or how little is sufficient. And that is also related to this difficulty of uh, you know, first of all, difficulty of reading and completely assembling the sequence information. And without that, it's really difficult to manipulate those sequence. So for example, you know, now, you know, that we have so much technology of editing the DNA, but if that's a, you know, the target is a unique sequence, you can precisely go to that target sequence to manipulate whatever the way you like. But if you have same sequence repeated over and over and over again like this, you just cannot, you know, the manipulate this repetitive DNA so easily. So uh, I think, you know, that that we don't know the exact, uh, you know, the degree of how much of the satellite DNA is required to do the job that we, I described today. Uh, with that said, we do have, you know, that we find the satellite DNA in other we are the places such as in intro. Uh, you know, we have been studying some really interesting, you know, gene structure. Uh, so that is, you know, the so-called coding sequence is like about 10 kilobase, uh, but it contains the intro that spans like megabases, right? You know, it's so much bigger than the actual coding sequence. So it seems like this, you know, the ginomous intron seems to have some function in a gene regulation. We don't know exactly what it is, but we, we started, you know, the tackling on that kind of question. So, you know, the satellite DNA seems to be everywhere and exactly how they function. I mean, just so much to explore and then so, so little we know about them. Yeah. Related to that, how do different species know that they have to evolve different repeats and how do they do that? Yeah, um, so I think this is more like, I mean, they are not purposefully evolving different uh, the protein or different satellite DNA. So by the nature of the repetitive DNA, so they are known to be very unstable, meaning one time you might have you know, 1 million ATAT repeats. It's so easy to lose some of them. Let's say it becomes a half million. But then because you need to maintain some amount of satellite DNA because it's functional, it's not junk. So that means, um, you know, the based on the knowledge in the field, I think it's quite conceivable. It, whatever the satellite DNA has, a, you know, this fluctuation of, you know, the shrinkage and the contraction and the expansion, contraction and expansion. And then this is just to, for the sake of maintaining satellite DNA amount, right? But then if you, you when you are expanding, there is a, so much room to introduce a mutation. So one time you might have a TAT repeat, when you are expanding, you made a mistake and the sum of the repeats become AATAC instead of AATAT, probably that is well tolerated by the cell. But if you but keep doing that, and you know, the one day you know you had 90% AATAT, only 10% AATAC, and then you know, whatever the years later, this percentage might flip. When that happens, you might better select the protein that also has a mutation a little bit so that. Um, you know, that's going to better bind to the new new spectrum or new composition of the satellite DNA. So I think that's how DNA sequence and then binding proteins are kind of drifting, not necessarily actively evolving. That's what I, I think right now. I mean, we, we don't have a, you know, evidence, but we think, I mean, I imagine that's what's happening. 
It's a great segue to the next question. How does a D1 protein recognize such a short cognate sequence, especially when the, the DNA is all coiled up within the heterochromatin? Right. Um, so we don't know exactly, but the D1 protein has multiple DNA binding proteins. And then this, you know, each unit is known to go to a so-called minor group of the DNA, which is AD rich. So we probably have to do a lot more of the biochemical, you know, analysis. I suspect, you know, the D1 has a probably broad binding spectrum instead of AAT, uh, you know, for example, maybe AAT, AAT might be okay, for example. Yeah, uh, but I, I, so how it, it's going to recognize exact, you know, the sequence or some aspect of the DNA structure that, uh, you know, we don't have a full, full understanding of it yet. Yeah. Well, I think uh, another question is what happens if you express uh, the similens D1 in melanogaster? Uh -huh, that's a good question. Um, we do have, uh, you know, the data we have been getting. Uh, yeah. So if you just express D1 protein from similens in the context of the melanogaster, uh, and that nothing, I mean, it looks okay, they look happy. We actually try to replace it, meaning you know you 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 uh, you know the melanogaster D1 mutant. That means melanogaster doesn't have its own D1 protein, and then you try to rescue that mutation by you know the similar D1 gene. It doesn't work. So that's you know that's pretty exciting. That means you know that they are you know the the you know the detail mechanism of the function or exactly how the protein interacts with other protein and so on is not quite the same between those two species and then I suspect that's also contribute to why you know these two species cannot hybridize. Okay, there are several questions relating to are there any homologs of D1 proteins in mice and humans? Yeah. Uh, are there are there any mutations in those proteins that cause diseases? Right. Uh, so uh, I probably should know better about the mutation. And I mean, the disease causing a mutation, I don't know. Um, um, we don't have, you know, the complete, you know, the homolog with a high uh, sequence similarity with D1, but based on the structure, you know, it's, it's believed that it's, uh, the, you know, the functional orthorog is so-called HMGA1. Uh, which is also, you know, have, you know, AT rich bindings, you know, the domain and so on. And then, uh, so that, you know, we have shown at least in the mice cell, I, we haven't done anything with the human cells, but in the, in the mouse cells, this HMG1 has exactly the same function as D1. If you mutate, you form the micronuclei, and, you know, that they are localizing to the chromocenter and so on. On top of that, you can actually even overexpress Drosophila D1 in the mouse cells. And that has the ability to bring, you know, uh, the chromosomes together, uh, Pretty well. I mean, I don't think it can it, it can replace the function of HMG1, but D1 actually facilitates the bundling um, of the mouse cells. There's several more questions coming in. So um, there should be a this um, one um, immediate follow up follow up from the speciation hypothesis would be that there will be a strong correlation between the emergence of uh, these different repeat sequence and the corresponding binding protein, the D1 binding protein, uh, what mechanism would assure uh, this co-emergence? Right. Um, so, uh, okay, this is, sorry, this is a really out there answer. <laughs> uh, you know, even less, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the real evidence yet. Yeah? But I mean, not D1, but we have another gene with a very similar function as D1 and, you know, how to say, they, they are kind of, you know, the partner do the, does the similar things, you know, they're dealing with a different satellite DNA sequence, but bring all those satellite DNA together. So in that situation, we have actually the one gene that's clearly goes to, you know, the bundle of the chromosome center, 
and then there is a gene duplication event right next to it. And then you have exact, you know, the sister or sibling genes right next to each other. And then one is way more divergent than the other. So, and, and then we have a suspicion by together, these proteins, uh, you know, the, might be, you know, adapting to bind to, you know, the diverging satellite DNA. Yeah. Related question to that, uh, is the D D1 protein same across all individuals of the same species or is it divergent within the species uh, itself? We don't know, you know, I mean, I think we kind of did, okay, a little bit of, you know, the Gyamru sort of experiments, you know, that we thought that's interesting. And that we specifically sequenced the D1 gene from, uh, so-called balance chromosome. Sorry that it, it's a little bit too technical, but that's a Drosophila chromosome that's not allowed to decombine with other chromosomes. So that means any genes in the balance chromosome is essentially trapped. On top of that, you know, that those balance chromosomes tend to have a little bit of different satellite DNA contents. And we thought, okay, maybe that gene might be, you know, the D1 might be evolving. And we didn't do anything thorough, but, you know, when we sequenced a little bit of those balance chromosomes, the D1 didn't have any variation at all, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So these repeats tend to be highly divergent. They are unstable. Uh, do we know what's the variability across different cells uh, within, an, within, an, in, uh, within a single organism? Yeah, I mean, that's another really good question. Uh, if you look at the just saturated DNA of the different strains, first of all, and it, I mean, I said the even protein is not different at all. But then, you know, the, the target DNA sequence have a little bit of variation between the, the different strains of the Drosophila and Melanogaster we already know. And then uh, within the individual, I think, you know, I mean, I think they are decently stable, but, uh, you know, the, because the, 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 you know, the destabilization tend to happen during aging. Uh, so, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, that's another interesting possibility. As you get older, you might lose the, you know, the repeat number, and then next generation, you might have to bounce back. So, uh, but so far, we haven't detected, you know, the visible difference. But again, you know, the minor copy number change, I don't think we can, we can detect um, for the reason, you know, we discussed earlier that you can't just sequence so that you cannot precisely uh, get to the, you know, the copy number or anything. So, you know, if you lose the copy number by half, you can see it. But if you're losing like by 5%, which is substantial, you know, in terms, you know, the in terms of the time frame of the evolution of the generation, but that five percent, I don't think we have an ability to detect that difference. So I think that's actually one major, um, you know, the uh, the you know the bump right now for me for us to address this specific question. So if you are interested, whoever asked this question, <laughs> uh, yeah, I and mean, if you have any good idea, yeah, let me know. Yep. Another question is in the hybrid species, uh, hybrid experiments, uh, when you see these micronuclei, are there two different types of micronuclei? Uh, uh, the chromosomes from one species goes to go to one kind and the other. Uh, so it actually doesn't look like that way. You know, the my cartoon was admittedly a little bit, you know, misreading uh, just to, you know, conceptualize the, you know, the, I mean, visualize the idea. Um, we know when, uh, you know, chromocenter formation doesn't work, all chromosomes are affected equally, and then you just, you know, the just ability to bundle anything is compromised, actually. So that, that you know, the, we guess that there's some sort of, you know, the biochemistry of the protein within a cell is making that way. Um, so that means when we see the micronuclei, it's not necessarily any specific chromosome or any specific pattern we can discern that, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah. 
So just to clarify, because there is another question relating to it. So you don't observe, it's not the same chromosome which no. you always see going to migrate. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there might be some, you know, the uh, some pattern that we haven't recognized, but no, no obvious patterns, like that specific chromosome always go that way, or this and that chromosome are always together or always separate. I mean, that we, we don't see any, that kind of obvious patterns, yeah. There's a follow-up question uh, to a previous question. Uh, so tandem repeats are present in bacteria that reproduce asexually. Uh, what roles will, will these repeats have in bacteria? <laughs> uh, we don't know. And in case of bacteria, I mean, you don't even probably have to have a, you know, the mechanism to bundle multiple chromosomes, right? You have essentially one circle that's a chromosome. So we don't know. I mean, that's a, Interesting question, but we, we don't know. But with that said, I would speculate, you know, the repeat binding protein could have evolved for some other purpose at the beginning. And then, but, you know, the potentially that could have been, you know, adapted later uh, for, you know, the bundling of the chromosomes. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's really interesting speculation. But so far, uh, we don't have any direct, any information to, you know, to make a connection between those two. Yeah. This, this is more of a clarification question. Uh, when you mated the two fly species, um, it's only the germ cell, it looked like it's only the germ cells that die and not the entire so, uh, organism. So can you elaborate on that? Yes, yes. Um, so I only focused on that germ cells that's disappearing from uh, the sterile female. And I briefly mentioned male would be lisa. So you can capture those males that's dying, you know, that they, they die as a larvae, you know, they, they don't come as a adult male. So that's why they, we just call it the dead, but you can actually go back in a timeline and then look at the much earlier stage before they actually die. They are somatic tissues, non-germline tissues are actually affected as well. They, those cells die. And then if you look into it, they have ton of micronuclei. So cellular mechanism is pretty much the same across. That's what we feel. So with that said, then you wonder, right? Naturally, you have to wonder why female somatic tissues okay? How come those female come out as adult fly only having a problem in the germ cells? That we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Why these, you know, the cell type specific, you know, the issues arise? Uh, that that's actually the big question that we don't know. Yeah. In the light of your work, uh, how would you? see hybrid vigor or can you uh, can you explain hybrid vigor in, in <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that's uh, now you know the, my new favorite question um so for the hybrid vigor to happen faster they have to be um you know the hybridizable <laughs> you know what i mean uh so you know the hybrid vigor is you know when two 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 parts are not divergent enough at least they are compatible in that situation i can imagine they can bring in all those you know the good sorts of things from each other but then once it becomes completely incompatible they can potentially bring in good things right from the gene you know hybrid bigger i assume that is you know that contribution to the hybrid bigger is having you know the different genes that's coding apart i mean i'm assuming you know i'm imagining Right, you know, the certain, you know, the um, so, but then, you know, the saturated DNA or this hybrid incompatibility is coming from the non coding part. So, the non coding part has to first, you know, function. I mean, in that, with the example of, you know, the Americana and the Britannica, right? So, let's say, you know, that there's some entry that's missing from Britannica or Americana, right? If you bring both, you know, oh, you know, you actually, you know, the increase in information, you know, the one, one entry of whatever there was is missing from Americana, but existing in Britannica, some other was uh, opposite away. You bring them together, you have better knowledge, right? I mean, I would say that's probably the hybrid bigger, you know, the equivalent to the hybrid bigger, but that is only possible when you still have the basic, you know, the rules of bundling those, you know, the books together. So that means, you know, the both of them comes as a bundled books, that's okay. 
but I would imagine, you know, Americana comes as a physical book, Britannica comes with, a, you know, the DVD, you might not be able to combine the information together. Yeah. I mean, you know, just as a, you know, analogy. Yeah. All the analogies and your talk in here as well are, are amazing. I think uh, it'll, it'll, just one, one uh, last question is uh, how, what has been done in uh, identifying the genes or this process of um, budding of nuclei into micronuclei? What do we know about that process? I think there was a related question earlier. Um, can you tie it to micronuclei and cancer or, or other diseases? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the previously, you know, the micronucleus has been mostly studied in the context of chromosome segregation, when chromosome is trying to divide and then it goes to the two, two daughter cells, some chromosomes are left behind in the middle. And then, you know, the, when they cannot completely incorporate it to the, 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 you know, vast majority of other chromosome that forms the, you know, the micronuclei. So, and so because of this prior knowledge, when we realized you know, the D1 mutant has a tone of the micronuclei, we looked into this mitotic defect a lot. I mean, seriously, I mean, because we thought that's the answer and then we didn't find that answer. And then when we did the live observation of this D1 mutant, what we saw is it's not a mitotic defect. You look at the, you know, the interface nucleus like this, and then all of a sudden, the portion of the micronuclei just indeed butts off. So the molecular mechanism of forming micronuclei seems to be quite different between you know, what we are seeing versus in as a you know the study the context. With that said, you know, in in you know uh you know related to cancer, right? Um so you know the, for the tumor genesis. The, it's suspected that faster you form the micronuclei, inside that micronuclei, there's tons of DNA damage happens and then that you end up is mutating some critical genes and that causes the cancer. So that means, okay, if you disrupt chromocenter in a way that's not too severe and then cells survive, animal survives, and then that might cause the, you know, the, some micronuclei to form and then mutate enough, you know, the chromosome damage and then mutation forms and that leads to cancer. That's really interesting possibility. Um, that's one thing actually I really wish if anybody has, this must have been super easy PubMed search. I feel ashamed that I have never done that. All those, you know, the chromocenter proteins in the mammals, are they identified as a, you know, oncogene or tumor suppressors? I don't know. I, do, I haven't done any sort of literature search. I mean, that's really obvious things, you know, we should be doing. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I think we're, we have reached the conclusion for today's presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Akiko, once again for thank being you. with us here today and sharing uh, all the wonderful insights. And thank you for, to all the members of the audience. Um, uh, please, uh, please save the date for our next webinar, which will be on June 15th, and we'll be featuring our newest writer fellow, uh, Tobilona Oni. And until then, uh, please take care and stay healthy. Bye-bye.